that's the idea. I'm going to get that. <laughs> Uh, it's the combo between that, uh, you know, the fact that we just had Tim Van Patten on and we talked about the Pacific, obviously, um, but also Minette, my girlfriend's mom, just randomly ran into you. Yes, um, like, she did at the airport. Yeah, in New York. Yeah, right? I, yeah I was working on a show. Um, I was actually playing Pete Davidson's dad in Flash on his new sh- on his new show, like his actual dad who died in 9-11. And um Wow. He died. He died in the tower. He's he's kind of like one of my buddies, an actor out here who's um from Staten Island, was like, "You're playing Scott Davidson. That guy's a f- fucking legend out here." So, wow. and and I just happen to kind of I kind of look like him, especially when okay. I have a mustache on my face. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and then I bumped into yeah, I bumped into them at the airport. That was crazy. That story of Pete's dad is legendary. Like, I feel like most people know about that story. And I can't even imagine you being on a project like that. Was Pete there? Like, he, on was, site? he was. It was really interesting because um, I didn't meet Pete. So one of my friends uh, is a really, really remarkable screenwriter. And he's writing a movie for Pete. Um, and so they've been in, like, super close contact. And my buddy forwards me a text from Pete that's a screenshot of me on set with Edie Falco who plays his mom. Oh. And it just says, your boy playing my dad, I'm crying. I couldn't go to set, it was too emotional. Because the scenes, I mean, they're like small little scenes, but mm-hmm. I, I guess they're taken from Pete's actual, you know, like childhood memories. Cause he, you know, his pops died when he was like seven. Yeah. Or so, so um, uh, you know, I, 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 I went back for a couple more episodes and um, it was, they were very kind. The guys were really kind to me. They said to me at one point, they were like, you know, um, we want you to know that we were watching footage. Everyone was in tears. And, and I, I don't owe that to my performance. I think I owe that to like the space that that guy holds and, you know, mm-hmm. and, and just, you know, I mean, look, man, the Pacific was similar in a sense because there's something about playing someone real, especially, especially like these men who do these heroic things. Right. That feels uh, like a bigger responsibility, you know? I mean, that's something that I really wanted to hear from you. The fact that, you know, obviously thinking Pete could, or the family could maybe be on site, the fact that they would even see something like this, but also you jumping in like, you know, nine eleven. the weight of that, is that something that kind of gets in your head or gets in your way when you're prepping for something? Or do you try, kind of just try to channel your best performance? Um, I, I, I think it's helpful. Like the Pacific was helpful mm-hmm. in the sense that you had to have a real gut check with yourself. You know, you knew, and, and I think most of the guys, I mean, you know, many of us are still remarkably, remarkably close friends. Most of us really. And um, we all took it with a real sense of responsibility. I remember being on the red carpet and um, I saw my, my buddy Dylan getting interviewed and, you know, it was the red carpet for the Pacific. There were a lot of really fancy people on that red carpet. And, and we were as the cast, the least fancy, you know, we were a bunch of unknown guys. And this woman was talking to him and uh, in the middle of a question of what was it like to play, you know, and she mentions his character's name, what was it like to play that real man? And then she started looking over his head to see like, you know, name celebrity. Sure. He, and I heard him go, hey, he's Aussie. And he's like, you look me in the eyes when you ask me that question. <laughs> and he was mad because we'd spent months and months trying to, as best we can, you know, inhabit their boots. So like, for me, when when I got the call from uh, the casting director and then my reps that the, the the they had offered me this part, I just felt this tremendous amount of like uh, like obligation to mm-hmm. just show up and be present and be real, you know, mm-hmm. um, and not fuck it up, you know. Yeah. Really You've always about. struck me as someone who takes their work incredibly seriously. And this craft is like a lifelong pursuit. When I first came to LA and I saw you and I was able to sit in on your class, it was the first time where I was like, this is a professional actor. Like I'd spent <laughs> like three, four years in my like, you know, classes at Syracuse with these 
kind of washed up professors, you know, spouting theories and like giving me all these kinds of techniques or whatever that weren't useful at all. And then being yeah. able to sit in that class and really see you work, see you operate, see how you shifted things. It was the first time where I was like, this is someone who has really dedicated themselves to the craft of acting. Is that, is there a distinction that you feel like you can make at this point in your career where you're like, this is what separates a professional from someone who's like, I'm an actor, but doesn't really take the work seriously. Yeah, I think so. I mean, one, thank you. That's a really, really kind thing to say. And, um, you know, it's one of the reasons that like, I'm still friends with like, you know, John Bernthal, John Seda, James Badgedale, Keith Nobbs, Jacob Pitts, J I mean, the Pacific boys, but is because Look, there's a part of being an actor that has to do with talent, right? And some people have this much and some people are Meryl Streep and Viola Davis, right? And they just have all of it. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, I don't know how else to put this. It's your guts, you know? Like when I teach and when my teacher taught and he taught me this, I don't let people in my class talk about their character as he and she or they. They're not like, well, I think she wants this. My teacher used to go, who the fuck? Who's she? I don't see her. It's you. And this thing about, you know, investing yourself in the circumstances of it. It's a bravery, I think. It's a bravery and a vulnerability to say to yourself, you know, when they yell cut, my heart has to be broken by the end of this scene. Mm -hmm. Or my best friend, I have to be living through the, the pain and the exhaustion of losing your best friend or whatever. And I look at it, you know, not to sound whatever, but I look at it as a real privilege. Mm -hmm. you know? I really, really do. And so for me, whether I'm on a set or on a stage or, or teaching, um, I look for people who see it the same, you know? And, uh, and in my experience, those people tend to work. Those aren't the only people that, I mean, I have plenty of students and friends who are brilliant actors who haven't worked as much as they should, um, who do that. But those that don't and do work very rarely in my experience continue to work, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, Bernthal and I talk about this all the time. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it has to move you, you know? You have to, you have to, and you have to be brave enough to, you know, live through those experiences. And, 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 and by brave, I mean vulnerable, you know? Right. So for me, it's that kind of willingness to really drop in, invest in, and be present in something. Uh, and the thing about it is, is it's the fucking greatest thing ever. Like when you get to do it, you know, I'm in rehearsals for a Shakespeare play right now. And, and I have to say, it's it's exhausting. Shakespeare is exhausting. Like your brain has to move very fast. But mm -hmm. that being said, you know, like today was my day off and we rehearse six days a week. And I'm antsy to get back to rehearsal tomorrow because, um, and even with a role like this that in some ways scares the shit out of me, you know, like what a privilege, like what a privilege that like this is what I do for a living. It's like, what? Yeah. What, what play and where are you doing it at, if I may ask? Uh, I'm doing Much Ado About Nothing, um, which, um, and I'm doing it at, there's a really beautiful theater in Pasadena called A Noise Within. It's like this beautiful, I think it's like 300 seat theater. Um, I think I've seen A Christmas Carol there. Yes, yeah. you probably did. Some, a couple of my castmates were in that, were in it this past year. I think they do it every year. And, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, and I'm playing Benedict, which is the lead, um, opposite an amazing actress, um, this woman, Erica Soto, who's playing uh, Beatrice. The whole cast is like really great. And I'm terrified because uh, we're setting it, oddly enough, in 1943 Sicily. So I'm basically playing an American GI who, and so the director has asked me to play Benedict with a full on New York accent. Yeah. New so York. I'm doing Shakespeare like this. You know, like this can be no trick. The conference was sadly born. Like it's, it's, <laughs> and I, and you know, and then this is one of those things, right? Like you're asking, you know, like you were saying before, Jacob, like I have no idea what a reviewer does with an actor doing Shakespeare in a New York accent. 
And right. part of me is shitting myself about it. But rehearsals are fun and mm. the play is goofy and we're leaning into the goof and then it has a real dramatic turn. And then we're getting really, I think, hopefully deep into the sort of trauma of that. So like, what a fun ride. Am I terrified? Oh God, yeah. Almost every time I step out on stage for an opening night of a show, I'm like, oh, we're gonna fucking see if anybody likes this shit, you know? But uh, um, but it, yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, it's just so fun. One know? of the most powerful performances that I've seen was Josh in his play. I think it was called Bully. Oh, Bull. Or Bull where it was essentially, it's about like workplace bullying. And it's it's a very prevalent thing that happens a lot that people just don't talk about because it's embarrassing. And there's like a lot of things that go with that. So Josh was this character who was bullied by his coworkers. And it, like I said, it was one of the most powerful, vulnerable performances that I've seen. Talking about being scared. Can you talk, touch a little bit on that? role and like what it felt like stepping into the shoes of a guy like that every single night well it's funny the first thing that comes to mind is when i did that show you know i grew up in queens right and i grew up like in a like a neighborhood you know and my older brother is a truly like a true tough human being you know mm -hmm. my brother has quite a past yeah and we have a very close relationship now and he came and saw that show and he came to opening night and when i saw him afterwards he was furious and he was furious at me mm -hmm. and he said to me and i quote you don't fucking remember what they taught you in queens because i the first moment of the play duke uh, this woman goes like we're waiting for like a basically like one of the three of us are going to get fired and the first words spoken to me are oh, are you going to wear that and i'm like what and she's like that that suit you're wearing that suit really and that's the nicest thing said to me in the whole play. Um, it was it was a really interesting experience because there were three other actors in the show, two of whom I had really good relationship with, relationships with, and one who I came to really, really love. And the director, uh, Jen Polono, is is we've done two plays together on stage, both of which ran over six months. So I was with this group of people in a theater company that I'm part of like as a member. So I trusted them all. And I have to say to play that role and get that fucking abused and that beaten and that belittled, that like, I don't win one moment in the whole thing. Right. Yeah. It was because they held me with such kindness. Mm -hmm. So that when Kevin would say something super mean to me, this great actor, Kevin Daniels or Leslie right. Farah, I could come backstage and be like, you fucking killed that. <laughs> that was so sad. Yeah, and yeah. the audience laughs so hard. So it's interesting, right? Because people have different processes and some people get really method and they want to like, you know, there are some actors who wouldn't talk to those two people and they try to create that tension. For me, the safety of knowing we were creating something together oh, so that yeah. I risk getting my heart broken every single night right. uh, made it uh, a process that I think I could dive deeper into, you know, because I didn't damage myself in it. You know what I mean? Right. Like, like for me, one of the things that's terrifying about like doing like if I was, I mean, doing a play and we're running for months. Yeah, I would have not spoken to those people. And every night truly, you know, like left stage feeling the after the performance and still feeling the same way I did as the character, I don't think I would have lasted. But on a night to night basis, I knew I could just sort of risk that, you know, do you, you have a question? Thanks, man. Yeah. And I think for stuff, even when it's really dark subject matter, if you are in, maybe it's t even tougher in a play, obviously, than doing film work, which is shorter, but uh, there's kind of a fun aspect to feeling like, oh, we are checking off the boxes. We are, it is being portrayed. I'm feeling it. They're feeling it. It's, it is still a rush, no matter how, no matter what subject you're dealing with. I agree. Right? I agree. I mean, Pacific had tons of dark shit in it. I don't, I mean, look, it's a joke amongst my friends. When I get a guest star on a TV show, the first question they ask is, do you, do you cry? Do you cry? Sure. You know, last year I had, Four, three or four dead children. Like I lost a kid to SIDS. I lost a kid to a Sandy Hook shooting. I had a kid kidnapped, all in different jobs. 
Wow. And, and I'm not going to lie, right? Because of the way that like, you know, you go about doing this, you know, my heart broke every time we did that stuff. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I had a teacher say it to me and I say it when I teach, like as thing as an actor, you have to really love falling in, like love coming to life, you know? Yeah. So I don't care what the content is. I mean, some are more exhausting than others. Some are more fun yeah. than others. But, you know, I know actors sometimes who have something like really dark to do and they're like, oh God, I don't want to do this. Sure. And that is for me, just for me, hmm. never my experience. For me too, fortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Mine is always like, let's fucking <laughs> go. Let's fucking yeah. go. You know what I mean? Let's yeah. go. And, 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 and I tend to find that the people I'm closest to in it, like in the game all have that same kind of attitude. Like I was a college athlete. And so there's a thing about like stepping onto the field, being ready to go, right? Feet under me, where's the ball being hit? Da, 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 da. It's an opportunity, yeah. Every time. So I, 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 I just love it. I really do. We're going to be kicked off in like 25 seconds. Duke, are you good if we hop on for like another 10 and then just close it yeah. out? Yeah, yeah, of course. Is that cool? So Josh, you just follow the same link. Yeah, 100%. I mean, got it. Yeah. the amount of stuff that happened during the pandemic that was just like horrible as well like oh just no we're getting through it you know healthy relatively and you know in one tact it's a it's a win what was your class situation like during the pandemic did you stop all together or did you do zoom stuff? i did some zoom classes and what and you know for me teaching acting over zoom uh seems seemed like something that i, I didn't quite get yeah so so i taught it i cut it taught a couple of dialect classes which has a lot more like school work in it mm -hmm. and then I did a bunch of zoom classes and I had like actors I worked with like John Carroll Lynch and Bernthal and um Michael Esper and a uh, Kat Foster and and um uh Chris Huvane unfortunately was passed yeah who was a manager they all came on these are people I knew and they would do these Q and A's with my students like John Carroll Lynch came on and he 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 screen shared scripts with markings and different colors and verbs like he he broke down acting for my students you know Bernthal talked about you know all kinds of stuff but like his process and and how he how he approaches stuff and took tons of questions and you know my friends were really generous yeah you know? and I think in a lot of ways too because they're all like truly creatives mm -hmm. the idea of being able to talk to young actors about the process in a time where we all were sort of frozen mm -hmm. uh, I hope was useful to them because for us it was you know me my kids I think it was really helpful the invitation from 2015 that Karen Kusama film John Carroll Lynch is a huge part of why that film is my favorite like of all time the guy's, so a, the guy's a genius yeah, yeah. And he's and I and I consider John a friend. Like we worked together on a series in Pittsburgh in 2018 for seven months. And he is a truly giving cast member. Uh he's a giving guy as a guy who just has more experience than most people, you know. And and he was really willing to do that. He said some really kind things to me. And I I I, I will never forget those words. Um, he's a he's a fucking bro. You've obviously sculpted out your own process by this point. I'm sure it moves and shifts, you know, even like hearing from John, like what he, what his process is, I'm sure it, it has some kind of an influence on you, but could you share briefly? I mean, I know this is, you know, truncating an entire process, but are there certain things that you've picked up where you feel like this is, this is really useful, or I found this to, you know, throughout these jobs was helpful. Yeah, I'll say this. Uh, one of the things in the way I was trained and the way I try to train actors as well is I have a good understanding. And of course, this shifts because your world and your life shifts, but I have a good understanding of who I am and what has meaning for me. I work with imaginary stuff. I don't go to past traumas. I don't think it's safe or healthy and I don't need to, but yeah. I know what gets me going. Yeah. And I know what, what excites me. I know what scares me. I know what breaks my heart. So having that at my fingertips and constantly always examining that when I can see, you know, a character in a script have an experience and if maybe it's something I completely don't relate to, but I can understand the emotional sort of impact. Yeah. Right? I now know like where I can begin and then take a rich visceral experience that I, that, that is similar um, on an emotional spectrum. And then 
once I'm like emotionalized and alive in my own sort of situation mm -hmm. from that place is where I do the work on the circumstance. So that, you know, I talk about this with people all the time, especially in LA, which is, it's this phenomenon. Like you get into a fight with your parents, yeah. you get in a fight with your mom, you get in a fight with your dad, you're in a bad fucking mood, you get in your car, your girlfriend, and you're pissed off and someone cuts you up like just a little. And normally you'd be like, ah, fuck you. But now because you're in a bad mood, you're like, fuck you. You in, you know, and you're in the security of a bubble of your car. So you can say whatever you want. I, emotion in my experience kind of operates that way. So when I get connected to a similar kind of feeling yeah. or experience, then when I start imprinting like, oh, this is how I feel about getting that promotion. This is how I feel about losing that job to this person. Something that a nine to five job means nothing to Josh Patton. But mm -hmm. it will start to imprint so that I can take the homework and leave it at home and I can start to build the performance. That's one thing. You know, an another thing is, uh, is really understanding, I think, the intent of a writer once you really get into something and then knowing what you want. Like knowing how you feel about every, that's the thing is like, you got to know how you feel about everything, about yeah. the other actor, about the room you're in, about the circumstance of your relationship, about mm -hmm. whatever, whatever's playable mm -hmm. you need a point of view of. And then once you have that point of view or those point of views, you can throw them all away because they're existing in your body. And now you can show up and just, and just play. You doing know? your doing your best to live authentically under the circumstances from the script, the blueprint. And, but that takes a lot of practice. Like, it doesn't need to be torture, but that's, that's not nothing either. That's Oh, no, no, no. Listen, man, fun. it's not for the faint of heart, you know, <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's. This is I hated you though, not to you cut you off. But I hated for the longest time hearing like acting teachers that made it sound like, Oh, just the process of acting. Even if you're doing a comedy or something is torture. I'm like, I think the industry is hard enough as it is. I don't know if the actual act needs to be torturous on all accounts. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, man, when I'm doing like when I'm doing a play, there's always going to be a point in the middle of a, of a rehearsal process where I'm going to take my script, I'm going to kick it in the sure. middle of the rehearsal and be like, I suck, right? Yeah. Like that, that, that's probably going to happen, right? It happens. That's the creative process, right? Yeah. yeah, and and you know, like Phil Hoffman, there was this amazing article in the Sunday Times magazine years ago before he passed, talking about the torment of creating a role. I find it joyous usually. Yeah. scary sometimes but joyous like one of the things that in my experience not always but most of the time whether on a set or on stage i'm just happy to fucking be there you know it's like it's like the cliche line from bull Durham. i'm just happy to be here hope i can help the ball club you know like i, I believe in that i really really do i i think when it comes down to it if you know the, we're, like we're we're like like you were talking about guys about like, you know, like college acting teachers being like pedantic that to me, that's the only thing, like they're great college acting, acting teachers. Right. I had, but um, is that it, 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 they got to excite you. It's like Shakespeare. Like people are like, Oh, it's Shakespeare. It's like, no, it's about murder and, and, and betrayal and someone trying to steal someone's throne, someone making you think that your wife is cheating on you. Like it is dark fucking gritty shit. There's and a you, lot to it. Yeah. That yeah. then, you know, then it's just human, you know? But I told Jacob one time just about like what I do. And I'm like, it's role playing. You're trying to do your best version of getting into what is it like to be the son of someone that murdered someone and then your sister betrayed you. That's a lot of imagination stuff to unpack, but that's kind of cool. That's like investigatory work and like- Oh man, I got to live in World War II without someone, without someone actually shooting bullets in me. Like that sounds sick. That you know, sounds sick. Yeah, you were about that set. It was like this expansive real world thing that really made you feel like you were actually in. Oh it. man. I mean, yeah. you know, we did the Battle of Bloody Ridge in on Guadalcanal, and they would they were just like, you know, you're gonna take, you're gonna shoot that guy, then that guy, then that guy, <laughs> then you, then you're gonna run out of ammo and grab your and grab the rifle and shoot him and him and him. And then all of a sudden you're in the middle of the take and it didn't and and you're like pop, pop, and squibs, and like blood is flying out of people. And it just, you know, at some point you're like you get lost you know? <laughs> and it, there's a real, Oh shit. Kind of moment, you know? And it, it's constantly, really it's constantly, and everyone's got the same job, the writers, the directors, the, the costumes, everyone's thinking, what would it really be like to be in this moment at this time, in this place? And when you have a true story, it's even more weight. Like you said, to be like, 
well, we really got to portray this for real. And that's, that's so, it's a gift. It's incredible. Not I'll tell you ever- one of the things that was really fun about the Pacific. So we were in boot camp and there was a Japanese boot camp, right? And we could hear them in the jungle. Like we could hear them counting when they were doing calisthenics and stuff. And then a couple of times, like late at night, they would attack us, right? And now we're shooting blanks and all that stuff. But, you know, you're, everybody's like, you're, we're under, we're sleeping like three to four hours a night. I lost 12 pounds in in nine days. Like we're getting our, the shit kicked out of us. And uh, we got attacked from the right flank of our, like, you know, like our, uh-huh. and there was like machine gun fire. And then everybody's like, start calling out. And we're trying to do all the things we're taught to do. And we return fire. And right after the fire stops, firing stops, some guy from behind me screams, contact right which was like three minutes too late because there's been loads of machine gun. That's what you call to call out where it is. And I, I don't remember doing this, but apparently quite loudly, I went, yeah, no shit. <laughs> and everyone laughed. Someone told Bruce McKenna, our writer, and there was a, there was a moment on, uh, on and right before the Battle of Bloody Ridge turns into like the full-on assault, we mm-hmm. get a couple machine gun fires. And it's like, ka, 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 quiet. And some guy, somebody screams, contact front. And then you hear my voice off camera go, no shit. And I, it warmed my heart because what Bruce said to us when we were shooting the combat scenes was, he's like, look, you guys got trained, you know, by these Marines. So if there's something that we've written to kind of create battle yeah. talk that doesn't make sense and you need to call for a reload or your gun gets jammed, just say it. So we had this real amazing freedom because they don't know every word those men said right. in combat but they want to create the reality of it and you know man they put a lot of responsibility but also a lot of trust in us and also like we had people like tim and tony toe and mm-hmm. uh jeremy Padeswa and david nutter and you know call frank we had all these amazing directors who were there to help us hold this up graham yost you know like great writers and and directors we we yeah we were really cared for you know and and to be really honest like i love those boys you know we 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 every every, almost every aussie one of them has lived at my house or stayed here at some point and you know and i have you know i've been at the the hospital for the birth of some of their kids and i've i've held other kids and and that's because of the bond that was created in the boot camp that captain died put us through and the relationships we sort of maintain and and you know i've had the the thing i shot in pittsburgh we got one season of show but i i i made some lifelong friends there for sure it's always amazing to get a job where it, it's just fun and immersive and you make lifelong friends from it that's everyone's man jealous. just a job yeah that's what we it. do for a living you know yeah. like you know the hardest part is when you're not working because yeah it's such a joy to work. You know? So can we touch on that? Because this is also called Hollywood Beginnings. And, yeah. uh, you know, you have this incredible mentality about the whole thing. I think that's what also leads to longevity. It's what keeps people in the game. Um, obviously, you've been on these incredible jobs. But I'm curious as to those like in between times, and even when you were starting out, trying to ramp up, trying to make something happen. Did you have that same mentality that you have now of like, you know, you're just really happy to be here. You're excited about the work. I'm sure there are people who have been through your classes, you know, they're just starting out. They're just trying to like make things, you know, keep things moving. And so what do you say to them? Like what, what are some of the encouraging things or, you know, tropes? So, that I guess I would say, I mean, the God, that's such a, there's a lot to be said there. Um, yeah. I went, I, I was lucky enough to go on that when I was, when I trained at Rutgers with Bill Esper, you know, it was, I think it was ranked like fourth or fifth in the country as a, as a, as a training program. And I did pretty well at school. I did a lot of plays and I got cast off in and, and then the showcase happened in New York and I got zero representation. Mm-hmm. And, uh, welcome to the real I, world. It was like a mm-hmm. massive, Oh fuck. And there were classmates of mine who got tons of represent offers and I just wasn't that guy. And, um, I was definitely panicked and definitely terrified and definitely went through feelings like I must not be mm-hmm. tall enough, handsome enough, whatever enough, tough, whatever it is. But I also got real busy really fast. 
you know, like that, those were the days when you would wait on Wednesday night for 1201 for the backstage newspaper to be dropped at the newsstand so you could open it up and look at the casting notices in the back. And every Wednesday night, I would, till two in the morning or three in the morning, you know, now it's all done online, but I would go and I'd put my headshots with a little cover letter, you know, and the role that I was auditioning for. And I would send them shits out by Thursday morning before the fucking mail guy came every day. I did in my first year out of school with no representation. I think I did 10 plays and play readings, anything I could get my hands on. I, I hustled. I, I, every time I did something, I contacted you know, the same agent at the same agency, I just fucking picked him at random. And I was like, that guy, that woman, that person here and here and here, they're just getting, they're going to be ones to get the call for me. I remember having a woman call me and going, I get a flyer from you every week, <laughs> three jobs you've done. Yeah. I have to meet you. And eventually I got a small manager and I started booking some theater. Um, and then, uh, were you waiting tables during this time? How are you surviving? In New York city, I was a real estate agent. I rented apartments because it was at the height of the New York real estate market. So I used to go to work, get, I would work with different realtors or myself and I would get clients and I would just run them to apartments all day. And if I had an audition, I would tell my buddy who I kind of partnered with, like between two and four, I'm out. And and I would, I mean, I learned, I, I grew up in New York, but I learned parts of that city. I, I, I've been in like 7,000 apartments in New York City like easy. Wow. And, and then I started booking some theater work and started to feel like an actor a little bit. And then I had this, I don't know if you know this, Jacob, I had this crazy job that came about, which was my buddy had an audition for eight mile and the casting director, Mally Finn, uh, who passed away, God rest her soul. She was amazing. Um, uh, she asked everyone in New York to bring their own reader with them to the audition. And she told me later that that was her way of seeing twice as many actors. And he brought me, because I used to be a hip hop kid and uh, my friend Jamal, and he was like, you're the only white homeboy I know. And, I, and so I need you to read Eminem's part opposite me. Um, Jamal's black. And, um, and so we, we, we went in and we read and two guys who were waiting didn't have readers. And Jamal was like, stay bro. So I stayed and I read with them. And then Mally was like, would you be the, would, I want to get you an audition for one of the parts, like a proper audition. And I was like, oh, I won, I already won. And then she said, I'd like you to um, also be the reader at the callbacks with the director. And at the time I was a theater actor. I didn't know who any movie director was. I didn't pay attention. Okay. Was Anton, right? Another person who passed away. Yeah. Um, we lost a bunch of people from that movie. And uh, mm -hmm. through that process, I was the reader at the callback they gave me a call back in the room for the role that Eugene Bird played so beautifully. And, um, and then I get a call a week later and they wanted to fly me out to Detroit to play Eminem's part in the screen test for these actors. So I flew to Detroit and that was on 9-10. So I, we woke up to read the first actors and it was 9-11. Wow. I mean, a weird series of events after we all found out that our families were okay because I had my stepbrother worked in the South Tower and, you know, it was all real scary. And obviously we just started this conversation about me playing his yeah. dad, um, talking about full circle. And um, Curtis came up to me and said, hey, man, do you want to rehearse? I, I don't know how to get through something like this without working. So Am, him and I got in a room and we rehearsed for a few hours and then a couple of days later, after like everything settled down, he screen tested the actors that I had read with. And then they called me and said, we think you had a good effect on Marshall. Would you stay and be his coach? So I went up coaching M for four months on that movie. Um, the, and so, and that was what, what kind of brought me to LA. Then I came to LA off of this sort of like big, but weird job, you know, yeah. for an actor. Yeah, yeah. And, and, <laughs> It was like starting over again. It was like everything I'd done in New York meant nothing to anybody. I had an agent at a decent agency look at my theater resume, which included like some of the better regional theaters around the country at this point, mm. say, did you get paid for these jobs? And I was like, yeah, I didn't go to St. Louis for three months for free. 
you know, they'd pay me like 800 bucks a week. They'd give me a car. They'd give me a house. They'd give me a stipend. And he'd be like, I didn't know you can make that money doing theater. And I was like, you're, you're a legitimate agent. <laughs> Where I felt like I was in fucking Oz. And then, uh, and then I started waiting tables and I waited tables for a couple of years. And then in, a, in about four months, I got fired from two jobs in succession. I was like, this isn't going to work. I worked the front desk at Crunch Fitness for two weeks. And then my friend called me and said, uh, I work for this woman, Carolyn Barry, who has an acting school and she lost her acting teacher and she's looking for people to audition to be the acting teacher. And so three of us did this workshop with, a, with, a, with the same group of students. Two, we each had two hours each. And Carolyn, God bless her, picked me. And, I, and so I started teaching then. And then, and then this is crazy if you want to talk about Hollywood beginning, because then still I'm teaching acting classes. I've got like a small rep. I'm on a softball team. My buddy on my softball team is like, hey, I'm a, I don't know if you know this, we've been playing softball together for five months. I'm a writer. I wrote a pilot and I want to, I want to get you in it. And I auditioned for five parts and was too young for all of them. And then he called me and he said, look, man, and I'd never met the casting director. I only met the assistant. And he said, look, man, uh, I really want to get you a job. So there's a ticket taker at the end of the pilot and it was a day's work. And I was like, I'll take a day on anything, right? So I came in, I met the casting director and uh, Mia Levinson, she doesn't cast anymore. But God, she changed my life. Mia and I talked and she was like, you're a, like a New York theater actor. You're like a legit actor. And I was like, oh, thank you. She's like, why don't I know you? And I was like, I don't have a rep really. And she said, and so I got the one day, three months later Secret. on like social media, like Facebook or MySpace maybe. I, yeah. I, I wasn't even paying attention. I was like, oh my God, there was a message from me. And she asked me to be a reader for an audition. And I called her and I was like, is this, do you still need me? Cause I was so desperate to just get my foot in the door. Yeah. So I was desperate. You know, and mm -hmm. in those lean times, even, you know, now, if I go a few months without work, my heart starts going, oh, you know, it's crazy. Megan. She, uh, she caught me in to be a reader for this pilot. And it was a really fun role. And I was reading a bunch of different roles, but I was reading with these, a lot of really great actors and I was having fun. And uh, on the second day, when I came in, she pulled me aside and she goes, hey, the guys want you to tone down your performance. And I was like, oh, God. And she said, they, they think you're outshining the other actors. And I was like, what? And she was like, they say they can't stop watching you. And, and I was like, I'm not trying to do that. And she was like, no, no, no. Nobody's thinking you're like hamming it up. Right. They're just really enjoying you. Can you tone it down today? And I was like, sure. On the third day, <clears throat> I came in. And at the end of the day, as we were finishing, after we'd read a bunch of people, she said to me, have you ever tested for a pilot? And I said, no. I said, I don't have an agent, Mia. I said, I have a manager, but I don't have an agent. I said, uh, I was a reader at a test once for CBS. And she said, I think they're going to test you for one of the leads on this. And I laughed, like laughed. I was like, we need to test me. And mm -hmm. then, and this is this, this for the people who watch this. Yeah, I, think, I think there's an important kind of mo moment in this. I get a call that, that weekend because I went up to San Francisco to see a friend. And she said, they're going to test you. Who do I call to negotiate your deal? And I said, well, look, you can call my manager. Um, but I know that like managers aren't supposed to negotiate. You have to be an agent to do so. I said, I don't have an agent. Mia set me up with three agencies, three very good agencies, like middle tier, but strong agents with a test deal on the table that needed to be negotiated. And they all passed on me. Your One kid. woman told me in my, in my meeting, you're too versatile. And I said, what does that mean? And she said, you can play too many things. And I was like, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? She said, you should focus on playing cops and firemen. And I was like, what? And then she said, you should, and I played a lot of cops, you know, sure, and sure. firemen. but she said, you should focus on that. And then you can branch out later. And in my head, I'm going like, what does that mean? Like, you're only going to submit me for cops? Like, what? And, but she said, I won't represent you, but I'll negotiate your deal for you. And I was like, I know I'm good. <laughs> and my manager who used to be an agent was like, I'll negotiate it. And she did. And I booked that pilot and I shot that pilot and none of those agents signed me. And then she said, I can't believe I didn't think of this. And she thought of one other agent and I met them and I was leaving to go shoot the pilot. 
And I, I thought there's a lot of integrity. They said, look, you come really high, highly recommended by a casting director we really love, mm -hmm. but we've never seen your work and we don't work with people whose work we haven't seen. So when you're done with the pilot, send us the pilot and then we'll talk. And I told that to Mia and she said, no, 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 no. And she sent them my test because I tested twice for the part. Nice. Sent them the second test and they called me and they said, we want to rep you. And they also said, we're not going to take commission off this job because we didn't negotiate it. We didn't get it for you. But the second audition they sent me on when I came out was the Pacific. Wow. Whoa. That's a success story. And the first audition they sent me on was with Meg Lieberman and Cammie Patton who cast the Pacific. And I came in for a one episode guest star on something, which I was so excited to audition for. And, and years earlier, there was a World War II miniseries that I apparently, I found out years later from Meg and Cammie that I was gonna book um, about, they made a movie called The Great Raid, which is a true story about these men being rescued from, um, a, Philipp from a, uh, a prison camp in the Philippines. We were gonna be doing a mini series about that same raid. And then the movie w was announced and, they, and ABC canned the mini series. So I went in for that one episode and Meg Lieberman was like, you, you know, you were gonna get that part. And in my mind, I was like, oh my God, you can't say that to me because I didn't get the part. And, and I had the audition for the guest star. And she said, I've got something good coming your way that I really want you to come in and read for. And then I read for the Pacific. Now reading the Pacific was five months, four auditions. You know, if my first call back was two and a half months later, I'd forgotten about it. But you know, <laughs> literally playing on a softball team with someone get, bringing me in for a one line role, meeting a casting director, three months later, asked me to be a reader who then tests me, I get the job, the series doesn't go. And she gets me, she helps me get an agent from that. Like, that's how weird and random this shit can be. Something that, um, incredible story, by the way. Yeah. yeah Something yeah. that Tim was telling us is like, part of the whole thing of like, getting to that next level is having someone like an angel kind of looking out for you. For him, it was Bruce Paltrow. For you, it was Mia, you know? So like, actually having someone like look out for you like that. Like, I'm sure like you're completely indebted to that person. It's like, oh. they're, you know, um, it, it's, it's hilarious crazy. to me that like a deal was on the table. It's basically free money. They just have to negotiate it and still three agencies pass. And yeah, to me, by the way, too, it just is another Testament, which everyone knows that everyone, it's not just in show business either. It's, it's in life. It's a good metaphor for life. Everyone has an opinion Everyone will come up with reasons why you're not the right thing for this or that. And then something will click and then something else will fall into place and something will work out. And then everyone will act like it was their idea that, oh, you were perfect the whole time. And it's just even more a testament to that. You have to have your own scoreboard. You have to have, you know, the plot straightforward in your own mind and, and then keep taking the high road because, you know, it's too easy to get pissed at the whole thing and come and, bitter and just be like, you know, shut down from the whole thing. But like you, you know, again, it's all about attitude. Like your attitude to that whole thing yeah. of like, it's, it's unreal. I think yeah, preparation I it's preparation meets opportunity and you're there. Yeah. yeah. Paul Newman said it when I heard him on inside the actor's studio, he said, it, he said, I, I mean, it's freaking Paul Newman. He was like, I, I never was the most talented actor in my class. <laughs> he asked him his biggest pet peeve. And he said, wasted talent. And he said, the amount of people that he watched, he was yeah. talking about drugs and booze a lot, but right. also like, you know, there is also a sort of stubbornness that you have to have because I've, you know, I have friends who I've worked with who are insanely famous and deserve to be so because they're so wonderfully talented and they're good people. You know, I think I'm what you would call like a sort of blue collar, you know, working actor, you know, like at best, you know, someone will think we went to high school together uh, I worked, I, I was at a wedding over the, the break and very, it's very random. Anything like this happens. The guy, the bartender goes, you're an actor. And I went, yeah. And he goes, you did an episode of Grey's Anatomy and your daughter got killed in the building collapse. And I was like, yes, what? <laughs> like uh, big Grey's fan, bro. I'm a big Grey's fan. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I mean, would I like to work more? Yeah. Um, but you know, I also have to recognize that I'm luckier than most people who sort of step their foot, you know, put their toe in this pool. And at the same time, though, it's that unknown factor of like, you never know when shit is going to get the up. right vehicle. And yeah, listen, I couldn't book a guest star or couldn't I, I couldn't even really audition for them when uh, 
before I did the Pacific. Yeah. You know? And then the Pacific came out and all of a sudden, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting work. Cause that's the thing. It's like, Oh, you, some Steven yeah. Spielberg and Tom Hanks have given you a stamp, Sam, yeah. you know what I mean? And so there is that luck factor too, but you're right. You have to be prepared and ready, you know, at all times to jump in and, and, you know, and play in the playground. If someone isn't getting booked, like in those in-between times, would you like, what, what's the most stock, like what, <laughs> what is the most bang for your buck that someone can do in order to keep themselves ready for when that opportunity comes? Is it taking a class like yours? Is it like, what is the thing? My, my teacher used to say no actor should be without class or therapy because you always have to be discovering yourself. <laughs> so yeah. I think there's that, right? The other thing though is, I had a teacher once said, used to say, love it or change it. So if you're, you know, if you think you're fat, or you think you're out of shape, either fall in love with that body or change it. You don't have to change it. You really don't because there are people of all shapes and sizes on TV. One of the things that I think can be real destructive, which is not exactly an answer to your question. It's almost the opposite is that people don't work and I've done this and I start to go through the mental checklist of what I need to change to work. And in the end, I, I, that's, that's just not the answer. You right. know, what you have to do is I think one, you have to feed your soul in other ways than this business. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're like a sports fan, you love movies, you love art, you got a dog, all of the above, you got good friends. That shit is important. Knowing yeah. what's going on in the world around you is I think important. Um, and then, you know, the thing about staying in a class is uh, you can grow and also you get to be creative. Like, you get a day a week in a class plus your rehearsals during the week where you feel like an artist again, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and, and it could be anything. Like one of the things that is really soul feeding for me is uh, like my father and I built my kitchen. I built a couple decks around my property. I built, you know, uh, I, that stuff makes me feel good. I basically redid a bathroom by myself. Like I, when I'm doing that, I'm happy. Yeah. So. I find a project, you know, I get in the boxing gym, I get in a yoga studio, like, you know, so I keep myself in shape. I read, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, whatever, like, yes, you keep yourself sharp, but it, but your focus can't only be acting. Right. Because Have you, you ever thought about acting. crossing over into another discipline too, to support the acting, like writing, directing, is that something I mean, I've got, obviously I do teaching, right? But I, I, I just directed my first short film that two of my students wrote where we're, um, we're in the editing process and, mm -hmm. uh, and I've directed a few plays. I produced a small movie with a buddy of mine. It's me, pretty much me and him and, uh, and two other actors um, that we're also, you know, not, we're close to picture locked on. I, we might need some reshoots or we might just put it out. Um, these are teeny little things, but it's me getting my foot wet. I, I, you know, my buddy and I, we got, we, we, we pitched a series to a bunch of big networks. We didn't get, you know, didn't get picked up, but that was another thing. I think when it comes down to it, like opportunities kind of come your way and I'm sort of open to any of them, you know, I'd love to direct a play again. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, acting's my love. It really is like, it really, 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 really is. Um, like I remember I met Lynn manuel Miranda because um, I, when I went to see Hamilton, I went with um, a, a friend of mine who's, who's pretty famous. And so we got to go on stage and she was on in a Broadway play and she's just a, like a national treasure as an actor. Mm -hmm. um, as is her daughter, who's also an actor. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and, <laughs> and they were chatting and like the cast was like, oh my God, she's here. And it was really cool. And she was like, oh my God, you guys are here. And she was talking to, to Lynn and he said, you're just amazing. You're just amazing to watch on stage. And she said, you're amazing. I mean, this is amazing what you've created. And Lynn manuel Miranda went, I write this stuff. So they'll let me act. Yeah. Like we sort of went at some point early on, I think nobody's like beating down as talented as he is. And he's fucking genius but as talented as he is he felt like no one was beating down his door to give him roles so he used to do these like like these workshops and performances downtown where they would freestyle stuff and put up pieces and from that eventually he did it in the heights and then from that he did 
you know, like, but it's interesting because I heard him say that and I was like, oh, I get that. Because anything that I would do, anything, there's a part of my brain that's like, how does this lead to another acting job? <laughs> yeah. Right. Because I love it more than fucking any. Isn't it funny though, Jacob and I talk about a lot how like what, you know, artists deal with of balancing their life. And I was really fortunate because I went to drama school um, as well. And that was like after college and stuff, I, I went in England, but so many of the people, actually the British actors were super well-rounded. They're all like jocks and like did yeah. stuff and were rappers and were comedians and everything. But then when I came back to LA and it was like all these actors that, you know, came from other places and stuff, they, they all wanted to be like Marlon Brando's and, and like Christian, B like method actors and stuff. And it was much, like they were acting like method actors. Yes, like, like, yes, dude, yes. Like, That's what I'm fucking like, talking. She makes me crazy. Storytellers. It, They've just oh, too many like celebrity documentaries and crap. It's just when you talk to them, they sound exactly like the other guy. They like, there's there's nothing authentic about. Like I'm like, well, who are you? Like who are you? You know, yeah, it, it's a it's a it grinds. I think a lot of people's gears because it's like. At the end of the day, be professional. Just because you're an artist doesn't mean you have to be like all other artists. Being an artist means that you're just really observant and want to hold a mirror to the world and, and create great stuff that pleases people or makes people think, whatever. Yeah, and your authenticity, like who you are, you're even through the veil yeah. of like big character work, but who you are, no one else can do. Right. You know, no one else can do it, you know? And, and so if you're sort of perpetrating this kind of fraud of like, I'm this thing, and it's not really who you are. Really what you're doing is you're hiding who you are. So your performance is a performance, you know, as opposed to, you know, like Sandy Meisner said, living truthfully under the imaginary circumstances. And that means you're living in it. It's why, it's why you know, you can watch 10 different people do Hamlet. And yeah. You'll in different hamlets and yeah. a couple of them will be genius but that, different uh, genius because of other version, playing. it strikes me as more insecure that other version like the more method totally i think and by the way it's not even really method sorry sorry to interrupt but it's like them trying to just be like a walking uh, phoenix or something sorry. rather than you yeah, know they uh, look at like ethan hawk or joaquin phoenix <laughs> And they go like, impression oh, of they seem like, like they seem they seem like what an artist is supposed to be. But like Ethan Hawke, you know, yeah. who my buddy Phil did a movie with, like he's Ethan Hawke. He's a he's a real dude. He's yeah. a real guy who's really giving his guts to his work, mm -hmm. and that is how it portrays itself when you see him work. But trying to be like him, right? Or be like Brando or be like James Dean, it means you're not being yourself. You know. The and amount of bravery it takes to be fully authentic in front of all the cameras, all these people, let all that shit go and be in the circumstance of this thing, I think is it, it's absolutely a skill. And it's something that a lot of people don't yeah. possess. Yeah. Well, sorry, 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 the only thing I would say is the danger of it, right, is that when it's done well, it looks easy. Right. So it's people go, I could do that. I can do that, you know? And then you get up on a stage, you get up on a set and you're like, oh, I pooed myself. I just pooed my pants, 100% <laughs> yeah. pooed my pants and I don't know where I'm supposed to say. Or yeah. it makes people overcompensate to try to make it seem more interesting than it is. At the end of the day, it's these parts that are amazing. It's, you know, on the waterfront is a great part. All these parts are like- The writing. Phoenix yeah. are like fascinating things. It's, it's not those artists as, how they are in their real life a lot of cool actors and stuff don't even care about what you think about them in their real life man you don't hear you hear very little about mount matt damon's real life like almost nothing but man he's got a great career and he's a great actor you know what i mean like look at the parts he does they're freaking exactly yeah. yeah you don't you know you don't see de niro on a lot of talk shows exactly you know? exactly he's, he's he, but he's but he has you know life a body of work that we all aspire to you know but is that has had happened at different facets. All of a sudden he's doing a bunch of comedies and he's super fun to watch. And, you know, and all of a sudden, like he does Silver Linings Playbook and you're like, oh shit, this is like, this is like old school De Niro. He's all over the place doing different stuff and he's vulnerable in it. But I know exactly what you're talking about. It makes me fucking crazy. Yeah. We gotta, we gotta wrap up. 
But I just want to say, Josh, I cannot thank you enough, man. Like I said, like you're someone I really fucking respect. You got such a, like a love for this craft. And that's something I think is really rare. And it's clear that you're doing exactly what you were always supposed to be doing. How you're saying like, you fucking love it more than anything. I love just being able to talk to people like you, like creatives. Just like a pro and just so clear to see why you sustain and you get these parts and, and I loved hearing your stories. Yeah. Uh, and I appreciate that guys is is really, I really appreciate you holding space for me to talk about this stuff. I love it very much. So good Let's luck. Stay in touch. Like, yeah, man, for Continue sure. Conversation. Out, you know, it is reach out anytime to me guys. All right. Take good care. luck with everything. Appreciate you, bro.